let's talk in some specifics about what the different parts of the digestive tract are doing, right? And we'll begin here in the mouth with this stuff that we call saliva. What is saliva? Well, saliva is watery, except for sometimes it's not that watery, right? And that's because saliva is a mixture of watery stuff and the watery parts of saliva are often very high in enzyme content, but it's also a mixture of water with mucus. And the mucus makes the, your saliva more viscous um, than it would be and also makes your saliva um, slippery, okay? So what is the job of saliva? Saliva is actually very important. Um, there are some times when people have problems with not enough saliva in their mouth. And the first thing that will happen is they'll start to have problems with their teeth and gums. And that's because saliva is busy cleaning your teeth and contains enzymes that keep bacteria from easily uh, hanging on to your teeth and, um, and having a bacterial party. So uh, saliva keeps your mouth healthy. Um, it also is going to moisten the food that we eat and it applies a smooth coat to the food we're about to swallow so it's easy to swallow it. Um, the next time you're chewing, uh, you might take a moment to appreciate the complicated work that your tongue is doing as you're chewing. And one of the things that your tongue is doing is rolling the food you're chewing up into a ball and pushing it to the left and pushing it to the right and staying out of the way of the teeth. And then finally, it seems like your tongue just sort of decides it's time to swallow. It will roll that food up into a little ball that's known as a bolus, B-O-L-U-S, and um, it'll pop it into the back of your mouth that will trigger the swallowing reflex. And as your tongue was wrapping up that little ball of food, it was wrapping saliva around it that makes it more comfortable for you to swallow. We're going to be talking, though, about the enzymes that are found in saliva. Um, not only does mechanical digestion start in the mouth, but chemical digestion in humans, it starts there as well. And that is because of this enzyme, salivary amylase. Let's do a quick um, review of the general names for different enzymes. Whenever an enzyme has got the name amylase, it is an enzyme that digests starch. And what is starch? Starch is a very large carbohydrate polymer made up of monomers that are monosaccharides. So this is an enzyme, an amylase, that will tackle a great big carbohydrate molecule and cut apart the individual um, monomers. Now, that amylase uh, can be made by different organs in the body. Right now, we are talking about salivary amylase because it's in the saliva. It's mostly made by your parotid salivary gland. However, later on, there is an enzyme called pancreatic amylase still digest starch because it's an amylase, but it comes from the pancreas. So it's called pancreatic amylase. Um, lipase. Any molecule that's called a lipase is going to digest triglycerides. And you know that triglycerides are three fatty acids attached to a glycerol. Lipases pop off the outer two uh, fatty acids, leaving two fatty acids with a monoglyceride. Uh, in your saliva, there is an enzyme called lingual lipase. Lingual lipase is there, but lingual lipase, it gets made by your lingual glands, but it is not active while you're chewing. So it's true to say that the di chemical digestion of carbohydrates starts in the mouth. The chemical digestion of triglycerides and proteins won't start until uh, the stomach. Um, lingual lipase, it gets flipped into its on position uh, by the acid in the stomach, and then it will start to digest fats, right? So what else is in saliva? Mucus, we know that. Lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that's designed to deter bacteria, 
Clearly it's not 100% effective because we have plenty of bacteria in our mouths, but it keeps it down to a manageable population. And then there is an antibody called IgA that is also found in your saliva that's also designed to discourage the growth of bacteria. Now, saliva's got a pH right around seven. So it makes sense that the favorite uh, pH for salivary and amylase is a pH of seven. Lingual lipase does not work in the mouth. Lingual lipase does not like a pH of seven. Lingual lipase will start working when it hits the stomach acid. Lingual lipase likes a pH of two or three. So the esophagus is really just going to take um, whatever it is that you are swallowing and it's trying to just convey that very quickly down uh, into the stomach. There are some times when the esophagus is unable to do its job very well. Um, if those muscles and that autonomic nervous system that allows for peristalsis, if that's been interrupted, then the esophagus no longer can convey things down very well and things will start to accumulate in the esophagus. Now we're humans, so luckily we've got gravity working for us um, with food, but in the absence of peristalsis of the esophagus, you will end up with things accumulating in the esophagus and causing trouble. Let's talk for a moment about the lower esophageal sphincter right here, lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is also known as the cardiac sphincter, and that's because it's right before this part of the stomach called the cardia. It's also because the heart sits right here. Okay. So this lower esophageal sphincter, it's not, a, it's not that good at its job. Now, to be fair, the reason that our lower esophageal sphincter is not that good at its job is that in humans, sometimes it is useful to be able to swallow some major chunk of food. And if we had a really good sphincter there, huge chunks of food like, you know, one large bite of hot dog or something like that um, would not be able to go through. But uh, the fact that the lower esophageal sphincter is not that good at its job in humans means that the really wicked mixture of acid and protease and lipase that's here inside of the stomach, it means that sometimes under some conditions, that wicked dangerous mixture splashes up into the lower esophagus. esophagus. When it splashes up into the lower esophagus, then it will digest um, the lining of the lower esophagus, and that hurts, and that gives you the symptom of heartburn. Um, that heartburn is partly caused by the acid from the stomach, but we also believe that the very powerful protease pepsin we'll be talking about is another part of the problem. So the symptom of heartburn happens because the stuff that's supposed to be kept down in the stomach it is allowed to sometimes splash up here into the lower esophageal sphincter and that that will damage the lower part of the esophagus. When people have got chronic heartburn, then they're chronically having this area damaged. That can make the lower end of the esophagus scar and get kind of small. And if that scars and gets kind of small, it sometimes can be difficult for people to swallow food unless they've chewed it up very, very thoroughly. So let's start talking more about the uh, stomach. We know now that the stomach is continuing to mechanically break up food. And that's why when your little brother um, eats his hamburger in three big bites without chewing, it'll still be okay because he can rely on his stomach to continue to mechanically break that down. The stomach is also going to mix whatever it is that you swallowed with um, acid and enzymes um, from the stomach. Um, as a result, it is going to create something that's kind of like a uh, cream of mushroom soup. Um, and that cream of mushroom soup will get squirted into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, tiny little bits at a time. 
Uh, unlike the lower esophageal sphincter, the pyloric sphincter is really good at its job. Sometimes it's too good at its job. Um, but its job is to make sure that this wicked, crazy acid stuff that's in here only gets squirted into the small intestine a little tiny squirt, little tiny squirt at a time. And why is that? Because this stuff is dangerous, and if it were allowed to just pour into the small intestine, it would really significantly damage the small intestine, and we can't afford for that to happen. So what do I mean by a little squirt? I mean that the stomach, when it's getting rid of, when it's moving along what you ate to the next spot, it's sending out less than a teaspoonful at a time. A teaspoonful is not very much. A little tiny, a, a teaspoonful is five mLs. This sends out three mLs. So three mLs at a time goes into here. And the first thing that the duodenum does is it sends in a squirt of its own. It sends in bicarbonate from those uh, Brunner's glands that you learned in 150. And so the pH of the stuff here in the stomach had a pH of around two or three crazy acid. But now the pH of whatever's here is going to be a pH of eight or nine. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is we are going to denature the most dangerous enzyme that's found in the stomach. The most dangerous enzyme in the stomach is pepsin, and it loves a pH of two. Remember from your enzyme lab that extremes of pH will damage protein structure, will denature an enzyme. Well, pH of two seems pretty extreme, but pepsin was made to work at a pH of two. So when it goes out here and suddenly the pH gets changed to eight or nine, then that pepsin enzyme is instantly denatured and becomes just one more protein that's going to be digested. Okay. The stomach does not absorb a significant amount of nutrients. There are a few things that can be absorbed directly from the stomach. Even water is not absorbed directly from the stomach, okay? And why is that? Well, you can think of it this way. The mixture that's inside of the stomach is really seriously dangerous. If I took some of that mixture that's in your stomach right now and put it on a bandage and put it on your arm and you had to leave it there for the day, it would digest your skin, okay? That's dangerous stuff. So uh, evolution kind of had its choice. Like I could make an organ called the stomach that holds this wicked dangerous stuff really, really good, but doesn't absorb nutrients, or I can make it absorb nutrients, but then it's not that good at keeping the bad stuff inside. Well, it keeps the bad stuff inside really, really good. And uh, that's why it's not good at absorbing things. Uh, uh, drugs that are lipid soluble, like, um, like thyroid hormone, for example, or medications like aspirin, they can be absorbed directly from the stomach, but not that many things do, All right? We're going to start here at the beginning of our next video.